Hello and welcome to today's episode of Home Screen. I'm Jim Safford and I work on the 11FS Pulse team. Um, today I'm delighted to be joined by Olof Eriksson, who is the uh, VP of Product at Copenhagen uh, business spend company called PR, a super cool company that are really working hard to solve problems around uh, business spend and then also the wider kind of area surrounding that. So an interesting one for anyone who's ever worked in a company um, and had to spend on their own account or anything like that. So um, today we're going to be covering a few different bits of functionality, one around reimbursement. So how quickly uh, can you get paid back? One around kind of connecting up to your bookkeeping software. So specifically for uh, zero in this instance. And then finally for fetching receipts, one of the banes of anyone who works in business spend um, or who has business spend will will know is actually getting those receipts is, is really, really annoying. So they've built a really smart functionality to solve that problem. So this show is brought to you by uh, 11FS Pulse. That's the product that underlies everything we do here. It's a repository of different digital banking experiences. So you can see exactly what great companies are building and then kind of dissect that into, into different chunks to see how they're being built. So uh, definitely check that one out if you get the opportunity. Um, but without further ado, uh, great to chat to Ulok today. What is Plio? Um, how does that fit within the larger Copenhagen sort of tech scene? And um, what, what's the core problem that's trying to be solved here? Yeah, uh, great questions. No, I think to me, I think uh, Mount sounds a bit cheesy, but like to me, Plio is an idea. Like it's an idea of how, how workplaces could and should be different. Um, like the, I want it to be places where people are trusted, respected, heard, less frustrating from spending time on menial tasks. Like, in short, more valued at work, and I think, I think that's why we show up. Um, we don't, we're not so like grandiose to think that we can solve everything around that and, and make everyone feel valued. But but we think that we can be a small part of that and be part of the solution and getting more like engaged and and happier workplaces. And with that in mind, the area we decided to tackle um, is business spend. Business spend is is a broken area uh, where, where companies like actually force as employees to borrow them money for mm -hmm. them to do their job. Yeah. Uh, there, it's an area where you need approval processes for buying a cable for, for 10 pounds, while it's perfectly fine to, to waste a thousand pounds on a bad meeting with ex executives, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and where everyone from, from the buyer to the manager to the finance force often are forced into this like error prone manual processes. And, and despite all of this, like companies still don't really understand how much money is spent in real time and if it's spent the best way and stuff like that. So, so it's really an area that's, there's a lot of problems in, right? Yeah. And, and I think our solution to this, um, Plio solution is more a business band solution. Like where we, where we try to help everyone in the company to buy what they need to do their job in a simple way. Mm -hmm. and, and we do this while, while simultaneously trying to help finance people, managers and others really like save the time and drive a healthy spending culture. So I think part of this, is, for example, being top of how company uses this money. Uh, from a product perspective, like our first iteration of this focused in on the card spend in a company. Yeah. And the, um, and enables a business to really give a card to everyone in a company and then we have software assisting throughout this spend journey or throughout this workflow uh, and that's kind of where we started but i think we're quickly moving beyond that to, to become more like a holistic business spend solution and also covering other types of spend within the company i think that that is uh, i think at the core of what plio is at least yeah uh, yeah cool and um was there kind of a a competitor out there before Plio kind of came about. How did they? Um, how did they think about? How do you guys think about the competitor landscape? Um, what do you think about other companies, and where do you benchmark yourselves in, in terms of that? Yeah. So I think it's, it's true for for most B two B products, but but especially true for us. Like the, the main competition is in action. The main in competition is keeping to your Excel sheets or keeping your old school like 
expense management solutions. Um, yeah, I don't want to want to drop names, but there's a number of, number of solutions that you know that you can maybe take a photo of the receipt, right? Yeah. Or, yeah. And stuff like that. So I think that's that's a lot where the the, the main competition lies. And then I think we have a, a number of exciting startups and scale ups in the space, such as Spendesk and Soldo and Conto and yeah. a few others, right? That are they're not not doing the exact same thing, but they're doing similar things to, uh, to us. That that's just really great to kind of help change the perception of how companies should do business spend. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like the more the merrier. Uh, help yeah. us change the help us change the landscape. Yeah, for sure. And um, I think there's something really interesting in, in that dynamic of being able to identify, you know, um, not only companies that look a lot like yours, but also what are the what are the um, what are the incumbent solutions that people were using in order to, to do this thing. So like, as you said, their spreadsheets or whatever, you know, your, your competition is not necessarily always um, the, the 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 kind of the close the things that look the closest like what you've done, but also the the things that people might fall back onto, you know, as a as a um, as a solution if everything else fails, which I think is quite compelling. And one of the things I think we're going to see today from your product is um, that you've really put simplicity and kind of ease of use at the heart of what you're trying to kind of offer your customers. So like from the from the first instance. Um, talking about how you gather receipts and then also, you know, how you can integrate with other software. And then in the final instance, how you can go about kind of reimbursing people in a, in a, in a real simple, straightforward way. Yeah. Um, so interesting that you sort of seem to have taken the approach of it's not the companies that we're worried about. It's more the, the features and the methods of doing this thing that we're trying to compete against. Um, but that's a, um, that's a slight aside. Plio itself, as you've just beautifully outlined, does all of these uh, cool things. But how did you get there? What what happened to you before uh, that kind of prepared you for for a VP role here at Plio? And what, you know, what have you done previously? I I started my career quite late. I think in my in my uh, my old twenties, I, I went to, to university and I played beach volleyball, and I didn't really. Work. <laughs> I had no idea what product even was until I was like yeah. <laughs> or something. Uh, but uh, but I was lucky to end up in a, in a company called Klarna, which I think now their highest valued like uh, private fintech in Europe, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I went there in, in 2011 as a salesperson. Okay. Like, working with our key accounts. and uh, But I, I was part of rolling out uh, like a, a new exciting product called Klarna Checkout. And uh, I, I think I ended up spending more time with the product team than I did with the, the sales team sometimes. But but in the end, I got an offer to move over to product. And mm -hmm. I worked with product there for like five five years or something like that in, in yeah. various different roles. Yeah. Uh, from from being a product manager to, to leading domains and areas. Uh, so that's, that uh, was there for seven years. And then uh, followed we tried to, to, to lead the show from a product perspective with this yeah. exciting company when they reached out. So... That, that's how I ended up at Plio. Yeah, and um, and with Plio as well. Like, so this is a um, a Copenhagen-based business. There are there are a number of really interesting tech uh, companies popping up around Copenhagen area. Like, seems like a great um, sort of city for tech at the minute. You know, you've got like Trustpilot amongst uh, others, and then a few smaller kind of um, flourishing sort of uh, companies. What's the what's the what is it about Copenhagen that do you think that that kind of is is fairly well suited to is starting to build itself up as a as a new kind of tech hub? I think we're starting to see it <clears throat> all over Scandinavia almost. I think Stockholm yeah. was probably a little bit ahead, but also became a, a big heck, uh, tech hub, right? Yeah. And I think there are various factors, right? I think you know the the social system we have encourage people to take chances, at this, which you know take bets on this. We have strong yeah. educations. Um, but but I think it's also one of those like almost like yeah, compounding interest type of things. Like when you're starting to when you have success or one or two that grows a bit bigger, it cross pollinates. Sure. See that so much in, in Stockholm, and we're starting to see it more in Copenhagen now as well. Yeah. Um, uh, and then besides that, like the country is so small, so that you you automatically think a bit global. Everyone speaks perfect English, right? And yeah. and you 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 have a global mindset almost from the start because the small market is so is so small, which makes yeah. like you, you get these companies that are super ambitious and, and want to go big. I don't know, but those are some of my some of my yeah. thoughts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, so you mentioned before, now you're doing this VP role. Um, 
how does that how's that reflected in the way that you've structured the kind of the product practice at Plio? Is there anything in particular that you came in and thought I'd like to run this this way, or um, you know, kind of how do you think about that as a as a as a practice? I was fortunate at Klarna to be able to Klarna Klarna likes to change things and are very action oriented. So I think we we tried so many different ways of building product and so many different ways of organizing. And yeah. I think I tried to to bring the the things I liked the most from there in how to structure the teams. Yeah. And um, um, what we've done a lot is that of course we are cross functional and we we build the teams with designers and engineers and product managers and stuff like that. So I think we have. We have a setup where we try to organize around our personas. Yeah, uh, we can. So, like, what is the bookkeeper's KPIs, and how do we make, make the bookkeeper a success? And that would be a team or the employee. Uh, yeah. How does the, what the employee care about the employee journey? Could be another example of a team. So we, we try to mimic our customers in that sense. But I think it's also like I would almost say like maybe <coughs> Apple products <laughs> are working on the product offering, if even that. I think in order to do great marketing today, you need product and engineers. In order to do great sales, you need that finance. So, so product very much like as a function, it's it's heavily distributed in the company and embedded in in every area. So, yeah. product is is you know it's both a function but also the offering in a way, right? Yeah. So, I, I, I would I would I would concur with that. Um, I've just recently started doing more of a um, data analytics and kind of more of a software development role here at Eleven FS. I was initially a, I've initially been for the first few years a product manager here, but um, one of the things that I've kind of found myself doing, and I'm not sure if, if I think this corroborates exactly what you've just said, is um, approaching the things that we need to try and solve, the problems that we need to try and solve from a data perspective, um, through that product lens, through that kind of like, this is how we solve particular problems. This is how we go about um, solutionizing these are the KPIs that we kind of need to hit and so on. And it just, it seems inescapable, you know, when you're, whatever, whatever you're doing, uh, regardless, once you've had that product um, kind of training, if you will, that yeah. they're, they're just the tools that you fall back on. Um, I find that at least anyway, in, in my limited exposure to uh, to both products and, uh, and uh, you know, the, 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 the kind of the services that go around product is, it's, yeah. it's more of a way of thinking than anything else, right? Yeah. I think it's a way of thinking, and I think this is a it's a it's a change. I think you're also just how you organize. If we're going to start to stay on that, like I think people used to organize around functions like marketing, product, engineering, sales. I think more and more companies are starting to organize around problems. Uh, what are we trying to do here? Is that this distribution? Is the go to market? Is the offering? Whatever it might be, yeah. and then you add people from from whatever function you need to be able to do that successfully. So we see a lot of these very cross-functional areas that has product teams, marketing teams and others. And I think, I think that we'll just see that more and more. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, we're thinking about how to run companies. Interesting. Uh, yeah. I, I remember being quite interested by this article. I think it was maybe three, four months ago, which said that Nubank, the, the Brazilian FinTech, okay. had acquired, they acquired an entire consultancy firm that focused on or specialized in closure programming. So like, um, um, uh, object-oriented programming kind of based around uh, practices of Java, that kind of thing. And it got me thinking that, you know, pretend there are these, there are tech companies out there which base their whole structure and organization around different programming problems or different, you know, uh, uh, engineering solutions to particular problems. Do you have that sort of, um, you know, with the way that your developers work? Are they working with particular languages in particular ways? Um, and and kind of how how did they come to that solution that that was the right thing to do? So I think I think we we try to structure the teams to be very empowered to kind of own know most about their 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 you know their personas and stuff like that. Yeah, and we we try to give them as much freedom as we can. When it comes to like certain things, we still kind of want to. We don't want to allow every team to completely choose their own language, right? Uh, yeah, stuff. sure. We do have some norms that we develop as more like a product org. Yeah. Uh, and there, there, of course, we, we have certain things like React Native in the, in the yeah, yeah. You know, Node.js, Kotlin, JavaScript, stuff like that, that we, that, that we use. Mm-hmm. And it's often driven from a, from a grassroots level, but in order to kind of like, you cannot just choose to create something in a completely different language. Uh, yeah, 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 for sure. That I'm not going to do that, that empowerment. <laughs> 
um uh any a new question kind of that um i kind of found myself asking on this show is if you could kind of magic yourself or put yourself in the shoes of um a product person of, of any tech company in the past 20 30 years and they're solving a specific problem um you know which which product would you go into why you know kind of what moment would you like to slot yourself in and be like i was part of solving that particular problem that's a good that's a good question uh, can i go further back than 20 30 years go ahead yeah of course no but i think something something i contemplate a lot around is like when building a product is I think there is this school of like iterate, really iterate, fail fast and kind of experiment your way to success. Yeah. Uh, and then there is the, almost this like movie script approach to product. Like you define a product, you build it, you market it, you sell it. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and and I think um, I've been very much earlier in the like the iterate and, and fail and, and learn and then do a new version. But I'm also getting more intrigued around like, you know, if you really want to change the world, if you really want to come something new, you can't often test yourself to that. It's like you, you find the local maxima. You need to have like an idea of how the world should look like, right? Yeah. Sure. And and there and I and then I've been thinking about like how do I how do I create that setting? How do I make people not just think about like how do I move this metric 30%, but like how do I move it 10x into two quarters, right? Sure. They have been reading this book called Loon Shots, uh, um, the last um, the last one. Uh, Safi Bakal, I think, or something. Like that. And it talks about a guy named Vannemar Bush or something like that. He created this kind of like almost like research setting, which like we need to like so fast find solutions to these problems and yeah. how to do this as quickly as possible. Like almost like isolate and just move and, and make the big discoveries, the big shifts in a way. Right. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. And, and uh, they were the ones who came up with the radar and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And which kind of turned the tide of the war in a large way. So I think about that a lot sometimes. Like, how do I create the setting in a team for us to like, to not just move iteratively, but like paradigm shifting in a way. And I think it, like we have a good idea of where we want to go now with with Leo. We can talk about that. But it also like the the ground shifts fast. Like, where are we going to be in ten years? It's probably not the faults we have today. So we need to be an organization that is like ready to take big shifts when when needed. So that would probably be, I would like to see how we did it, like in the thirties there, how we created that organization and, and how they managed to like, I think they got like eight Nobel prizes coming out of that research or something like that. Wow. Think, over the... I guess, you know, one of the great things about, you know, uh, that time in history is that um, amongst all the te many terrible things that happened is that this, this was um, from great kind of crises, great moments of crises, you have great moments of innovation and kind of the um, the needs must in a way, you know, like, uh, we think here in the UK about, uh, Bletchley Park, the, the, the scientists, the, uh, Alan Turing creating the Turing machine and so on. And, you know, these, these things don't happen, um, don't necessarily happen, uh, unless there's kind of huge groundswell and huge problems that, that generate the environment for them. Um, but one, one thing that's really compelling, I think, is that every problem, uh, every product, no matter what it is, will face a huge uh, existential crisis. You know, um, for example, last week uh, we spoke to um, some folks from a, a UK company here called Chip, and yeah. um, the one of the product managers there mentioned that they were really interested by Netflix moving from a kind of um, their product being like a box and then move it to more you know, cloud-hosted sort of solutions. Yeah. Um, and that was their big shift, their big product kind of um, moment where they figured what they needed to build. From Plio's perspective, have you had any big kind of challenging moments uh, in the past few kind of years or so? And how how were they overcome? What were the what were the means to solve those problems um, with 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 the product? Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, I don't think we have had to make this kind of major shift that Netflix has done a few times, right? From like yeah, the yeah. subscription to the streaming to actually creating their own content and stuff like that. They they managed to kind of reinvent themselves a few times. Uh, I think we have had tons of challenges, but not not at that level. Uh, I think we have challenges every day. Like, I think they, they come down more to maybe how we work or certain projects where, where I can speak about, if you like. Um, I think one challenge we had, which I'm also also grappling with, like how how do you get maximum speed in the right direction, right? 
-hmm. And I think it's easy, like, ah, you need sense of urgency, which is, of course, is important. And you need, you know, the engineers need to be better engineers or like whatever it might be, right? But like, it's, to me, it's a lot around, a lot around other things. And I think it's a lot around the product manager. I think they're the key driver. I think, for example, like how, how are your requirements clear enough and do they understand the setting and stuff like that? But I think when I, when I, uh, when I started or a while back, I think we were, we were too slow in product. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right? And I think we, it took too long to define what we were going to do. We could, we could spend a few months on a problem. Right. Right. Uh, or more, which was, at first glance, it maybe didn't seem that. And then I, we started looking at like, why are we doing this? And I think one, one takeaway, there were a few was like, we are verifying everything. Like okay. we make no assumptions. We are verifying every little piece of this and to, to the really the extent we can. And that can also like, well, that's positive, right? Like then you make sure you don't, you don't mess up. Yeah. Um, and, but we then try like, well, actually some of these things, you are like 90% sure of this, you know, this space, you know, yeah. how something works, you know, how this works. Do you really need to verify this with 10 more customers? Mm -hmm. Like to get that. And it's like, no, nah, maybe you don't. So we started being much more like, where do we actually spend our time verifying? Where do we go deep? And, and where do we kind of trust our knowledge? Mm -hmm. And it was a little bit back to organization that we organized in a way that maximized the learnings, right? Uh, for that space. And when we when we kind of encouraged our PMs in order to be like, you know, trust yourself. Yeah. Uh, you, we saw drastic reduction when it was okay. Like, yeah, I don't have to have made an experiments to prove this little part of it. Like, you, you know this that that made a drastic shift in just how quickly we would get to good uh, good requirements and, and be able to like then get a new version then a third version a fourth version in a way right to that would improve the quality and spend then on spending three months defining the first one and then never getting to the second one yeah like that that was one challenge but it's we have many like how do you localize the markets in a good way and yeah. how do you handle COVID like pick a day I mean, i'll pick your challenge the, the the compelling thing there is i think um and this is from other conversations i've had with you know really good product managers um who say that that is the the skill for the product person is you know knowing when when you need to learn more about the problem and then when you can trust your gut and go you know you're essentially i you know others people have said to me before you're paid to know kind of in a way when you know, when is the time to take the chance on this scenario or on this outcome? Um, and to, you know, to, to have that judgment, to know your customers well enough and also to know the product well enough um, to say, this is the right thing for me to do at this time. And it's, it's, it's hard, you know, like as um, I'm sure there'll be people watching this now who are like me, you know, two years into a product career or something. And then you're telling, and then you're sitting there telling them to, to back themselves. I can imagine there's a lot of imposter syndrome where people will think this is, this is, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if I back myself to make those decisions, yeah. um, which may, is that a culture thing, do you think, or? A... Well, I, th I think it's definitely a culture thing. Like you, you need to have an environment where, where you trust people and, and where you're giving them power. And like every now we're going to make, we're going to make it, get it wrong. And, yeah. and that has to be okay. You don't, you can't have a product or that optimizes for not screwing up. Mm. Like, you will, you will get nowhere. They will always take the safe bet. So, so uh, I'm not really into the full, like, yeah, like, you know, break things and move fast and break things. I'm not fully into all of that because I think sometimes I create almost like some things you can verify to make sure you don't talk for your customers or sorry about the language. Uh, but, but it is really about creating that environment with, with high trust and, and it's being okay to be wrong sometimes. Yeah. And, and that comes with the process. Uh, yeah. You want to do things. If you want to do good things, you're going to be wrong. Well, that's, um, that's very reassuring to hear. Um, First up on our list of things to check out today um, from Player's product is reimbursement. So um, just to preface what we're going to see here earlier, um, Olav, you talked earlier about um, prioritizing, or we talked about prioritizing kind of the, the convenience of the speed. And so a lot of what we're going to see today is very short, very compact functionality, which does something very quickly, very yep. um, that might take a long time to do. Um, so without further ado, let's have a look. Right. So, uh, in this, in this, we've, we've got an individual transaction and then one button, we can see the visual of the card and that's reimbursed. And then transactions are in a way sort of removed from our screen. So 
what was that 12 seconds in total to do that very fun that very basic functionality but you know what what would typically happen before that you know in the sense of we've just seen something very quick but how would that take place before what would be the steps that people would have to go through in traditional expense management systems you would you would have the employee paying out of pocket and i think we don't want that right we want them paying with a with a card or or other means of using the company money yeah but every now and then just to give a little bit of context there are scenarios where there will be a, be a debt to the, the company to the employee or vice versa for example if you make a mileage claim the company will owe you money or if you're doing a per diem in certain markets or you know you were in you were in germany and they didn't take card at the restaurant right and and you need to get to get the money back and i think the traditional way is often quite the manual process done by the finance system and maybe you'll get paid on your next salary mm. so do you like you know, you lend money to the company, but you get paid a, lo a lot later. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think our product is just like, why does it have to be that way? Like, can't we just have them like with one clip, put the money in their card you know, when those scenarios or, or in their bank account. And, and we have the infrastructure to do all those things. Mm -hmm. Just do it, right? Yeah. We, we invest the So that is one scenario that where it's just like, instead of sending an approval process with somebody signing it through into the accounting system, moving it in, doing a manual entry in the accounting system, going to the bookkeeping system, doing a change there, and then adding it to the payroll system and then getting paid six weeks later. Right? Yeah, yeah. I remember that actually when I, when I had my last job, like I think one of my first business trips, I had, like I told you, I was a, I was a poor beach volleyball player. Like I didn't have any money and I was, I was paying for hotels and I was away for like a week. It was like, I don't really have this money here in my, like I didn't have a credit card. Like it, it was quite a big deal to be able to put out 20,000 sack for, for, for six weeks or whatever it was, right? Yeah. So these are just, that's one example, right? Yeah, and, and so like the flow itself, as you see now, is super simple. Um, was there, is there any suggestion as to why that process previously took so long? And then is, I presume there were no regulatory hurdles for you to overcome to be able to create functionality like this. No, but I think it's a little bit where we're coming from here because what we have done is that we've invested quite a bit in our in our money or fintech infrastructure, if you will, with relationships and setups with JP Morgan, with, with Danske Bank, with or even issuing our own cards and like we, we have a very solid base here that allows us to very simply do these type of things versus if you are Expensify or you're a traditional, just a software, mm -hmm. doing this is, is much more complicated. So, so we're, we're trying to kind of leverage the investments we, we already have in our payments infrastructure to be able to do these things and we can then do them, them better. So it's, it's building on top of that. And that's a little bit as the product is now shifting from a, just a, a card into like a total expense management just in a business spend solution. Yeah. It would be one of the reasons why, why we hope uh, that, that our product will be more compelling than a traditional expense management system, even on their territory of like when you have to reimburse. Yeah. yeah. And I think I, I think I genuinely would know the, would know the answer to this now, um, before even asking it, but just to, just to, uh, just to ask it nonetheless, measuring kind of your success, do, yeah. would you do that on the feature level? Like for, for, for something like this, for a feature like this, would you say, um, we need to validate that this is doing a good job or can you, is there general performance indicators that tell you that sort of thing? So I think we, I think if we're looking at like metrics in a way, right? I yeah. think there are types of metrics that tells different stories. So like, I don't think about metrics as just success, not success. I think, you know, you want to cover different parts of that. So like you would look at like health metrics, uh, how, how well is this performing? What's the uptime? Does it go down? The uses metric, like how are they actually using this product and does it work? Is it adopted? What we also look at, which is part of the success, satisfaction, like how do they experience this? Mm -hmm. Um, but also in, in a way outcome where possible, like this might be tied to hard to tie directly to financial impact, but those are the type of metrics we would look at, um, or are looking at in, in, in features like this. And in this one, it's not about like, yes, it needs to hit, you know, this amount of seconds or whatever to, to, to provide a value. I think we, we validated that the value is there and, and stuff like that. It's more about like the adoption and that it's, that it's really working. And, yeah. and and um and when it comes to kind of creating these features themselves are they um you know you've, you've touched there on the fact that validation can come from someone's understanding of the product and and the, and the user and so on but um 
do you find that a lot of these ideas are directly generated by with from you know you within or are they requested from customers how does that usually work i think it's both mm. i think we we have an idea about where we want to take the product right and, yeah. and that comes with certain things or so certain problems we want to solve and the ideas will come from sales or from, from me or from ceo or from engineers it can really come from anywhere yeah but a lot of comes from the customers and the, the thing about customer feedback is that they will tell you almost inevitably what they see at a competitor. Mm -hmm. right? We will show a feature called fetch later. It's like, yeah, can we have an email forwarding? Right? Because they've seen that somewhere, which is, which is perfectly fine. Yeah. But what often happens is then when we speak to the customer, we, we kind of like, okay, but what do you really want? Mm -hmm. Like what is the real problem you're trying to solve here? Like the, the, the request from a customer will be here. Like, could you please make a great integration so we can in integrate this to our payroll system? That we've been asked a number of times, right? But okay, but why do you need that? Okay, well, I want to be able to reimburse my customers. Okay, it's reimbursing the customers, problem, right? So, so it's a combination. Like we, we often get a lot of the comments from the customers, but then we, we try to break them down into to you know, what are you really trying to achieve? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Often leads you to be able to simplify things. It would have been much more complex to build integrations to the payroll systems to solve this problem. Hmm. And how do you how do you gather that feedback? Are you doing um... Is it all coming in through like support channels and that sort of thing? A good product manager should spend like half their time with the team and half their time with customers and stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot about being exposed to customers, going to customer meetings, watching how they work, you know, trying things with them. Yeah. So we have that, but then we have also, we, we actually use product board, uh, which I think is, is working, working quite nicely where, you know, they will tag things in Slack or in, in HubSpot and other things like that, the conversations with customers and we'll just, we'll get almost like quantitative data on what people are asking for. And then we look at that and we try to see the clues and, and then we dive in. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. That's really cool. Um, I think we do something fairly similarly, similar with Airtable, which I think is a, also a nice solution uh, hmm. to that. So um, on this next step, we have um, a kind of integration with, with Xero. Right here. So um, this is a different view from what we've um, seen before. This is a dashboard view on the desktop. Mm -hmm. um, so immediately makes you think, is this a different type of user? Um, and then there is an export option at the bottom of this side navigation. And this says to us, um, we have a certain user here um, and they've spent a certain amount of money on that. And uh, on the right hand side, there are some details and we can tag the, um, the transaction with a certain account yep. and attach a receipt. We've got one there already attached. And then once we're happy with the data that's already within that record, there's an export queue, um, kind of like a, a Git push for a software developer, I guess. And then you um, can continue and push that up to zero, as we can see here. Nice little bits of language there to kind of say um, that that's gone through. And then a cool little kind of uh, illustration saying that you've got nothing else to do. So and in Pleo here, there's the transaction. We can see a tax rates calculated um, and then the total amount. Yeah. Right, cool. Um, a, an interesting bit of functionality there because um, Zero is a platform that um, some might think is treading on your turf. Um, so, what's the what is the thinking behind working, you know, fac facilitating Zero in the way that you have done here, like getting people's um, kind of transactions into Zero? On the first level, I think. What we showed there was the, the most painful process you could possibly go through uh, to start with. Uh, in most of those cases, we we actually have done that work for them. With the, you know, we already automated the category, and you know, we we pre-selected all the things that doesn't need amendment and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it really is, is one click. But I think the, to your questions about the relationship with Zero, mm. so I, I'm I don't believe in is all encompassing ERPs that does everything. I think great products live in an ecosystem and works flawlessly with other, other things. And we're not aiming to be an accounting system. Okay. Um, and, and CEO is not aiming to be a complete business spam solution. Uh, so 
the, the, the relationship is it's like it's very integral that we work great together yeah. then it might be so that certain things you could do in zero they choose to do in us in our platform or, or vice versa which is okay whatever is easiest um but but we believe a lot in having those type of things and we have also deeper integrations with zero with like live feeds when transactions comes in and, and various things yeah to just make the the day-to-day -day life for the bookkeeper like easy like we if a machine can do it like a human shouldn't right and in most of these cases it's unfortunately a human that has to do it so that's that's what we're trying to do yeah and how um how did you find the experience of like what you talked about there of seamless integration between Plio and Zero's accounting platform. Um, was that a big job? Honestly, no. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, I think Zero has, they're, they're, they're a good company. They're a modern company. They have good APIs and stuff like that. They're, they're good to work with uh, in, in almost all aspects. So that was that wasn't so tricky. Yeah, and part of this was, of course, the like the live connection with Zero. It's like it might not be super bit difficult to build, but it's it, it is difficult to build. Of course, I'm not trying mm -hmm. to diminish work. It, it is complex, but it's also it's a lot around what happens, you know, before that. How we kind of for you mature the expense to be able to be book kept. Yeah. So that, like we don't want an employee or an admin to sit and choose a cost center or or anything like that. All, yeah. all of that can just happen. That you shouldn't have to go in and check if there's a receipt or all that kind of stuff. So that's yeah. that's not where our focus are. To like, how do we prepare for the export? And the export cannot be done in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. but, but that needs to work obviously. So it's it's kind of that journey of of removing pains. Yeah, and. Um... You, you're removing pains for a very particular type of user here. What was the persona or the, the person that you were trying to help out with this? So here it is, the bookkeeper. Okay. Uh, and is that one of maybe two or three personas that you might have for a user? So so the interesting, I think super interesting, Billy, this product is there's quite a few. Right? Okay. Yeah. And, uh, so one is the buyer, uh, of course. And the other one is the manager who maybe needs to keep the budget or make sure that people are buying the right things. And then you have the bookkeeper. But then you also have... Um, often like a CFO that wants to keep track of spending in real time and do analysis and things like that. Yeah. So, so the, those are made for, you can also argue there's like an administrator that does the onboarding and the topping up of the wallet and, and things like that. But, but there are quite a few different users and, the, and depending on the, 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 the user, we kind of also choose the platform, like an, an, an employee that are buying things, they just need the app, yeah. they need nothing else. Um, while yeah. a keeper often likes the bigger screen. Mm. And um, and just as a, an aside, one of the things that we're not looking at today, but one of the things that Plio does facilitate is um, from that user or with the app is the ability to generate virtual cards and to pop them onto kind of Apple Apple's payment platform. I guess another just a slight um, nod to very quick, very easy virtual kind of payment for facility. Um, but um, from the back to this kind of individual sort of web-based view, the bookkeeper here has a certain number of requirements. Like what are, what do you think, what, what do you think about there and how do you kind of think about their requirements? Bookkeeping is, is quite rule bound, right? There, there are certain things that you need to capture. Mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, they, they are somewhat predictable, right? Uh, you can figure out, you know, without having to ask a user, what is the VAT right here? Or does this VAT, this receipt has two types of VAT on it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how do what? How do you bookkeep this typical expense that happens every month? So, so we think a lot about a lot about that. Like, how can we how can we actually all this? How can we how can we just automate the crap out of it? That that's really what we obsess about for the bookkeeper. And yeah. That is really what they care about. Yeah. Um, so, th so that is our main focus. It's it's uh, it's kind of fun. I didn't work so much with bookkeepers at Klarna. Uh, I, I sat, I think, two, two hours a day with a Spanish tax, tax consultant in the morning trying to figure out, like, what are the regional things here in Spain that we really need to nail, right? And that's <laughs> both the, the law and then it's also, like, what is practice and, you know, what are the opportunities to do things better? So it's, uh, I don't know, <laughs> it might sound strange, but it's quite exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can bet, actually. Um, definitely a, a, a compelling way to solve problems and as you said before like doing the thing that you need to do as a product manager you spend time with like the people who know exactly how to solve your problem um 
the final journey that we'll take a look at is uh, continuing on with this theme of kind of um, speed, kind of uh, ease of use, that sort of thing. So we've got a notification on there uh, saying you've made a purchase. Um, and then an email pops into our Gmail account saying that we've got an invoice for that purchase. And then Plio automatically figures out that that is correlated to our last transaction. Um, and it's sort of figured out that that's kind of automatically needs to be grabbed. Yeah. So um, a notification is based for you there, that these are the things that, um, but, but what's actually going on here? Like what's, what's technically happening? What is technically happening is that we see a transaction coming in yeah. uh, from, on the card. And then we, we, uh, we use the, the, like an API towards Google to, to actually scan the, the inbox, searching for certain things connected to that expense. Yeah. Um, finding those, pulling those out, and pulling them, and that could be like in a PDF or it could be you know directly in the email and stuff like that. Okay. Um, taking that part, taking it over to Plio, and then matching it with the right expense mm -hmm. uh, that, that came in and posting that receipt in for them. Yeah. And, and this comes down to, of course, like the, the problem was like, okay, people are making purchases online and with Corona and all that kind of stuff, we see a big shift to online, right? Yeah, huge, yeah. And a lot of the receipts that you get come in via, via email. And it's like, do you have to go and like, we actually, when we looked, our users did it. It's like, okay, they would like bring up their iPhone, take a picture of the, the, the laptop, right? With the receipt and stuff like that. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> We try to figure out like what should we do here how can we make this as easy as possible and i think the, the obvious solution was like okay let's make an email formatting tool uh, uh, yeah we think i think we can do better like uh can't we just do this like why do they even have to do that can't we do this for them uh, uh because the people get so many emails and often you maybe you get the email two days later and then you have to remember that and, and stuff like that yeah. so so then we just took on let's just solve this problem for the for the consumer and we try to find a way that we thought was 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 better than trying to integrate to the various portals or to uh, to forward it in some way so now you can do it via your app just the share function or you can do it to, you'll do it just by letting us do it yeah this for 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 Microsoft and it works for, for Google. And as you said before, that's really compelling as a as a as things move a little bit more. Um, one of the one of the kind of I was thinking about this feature and one of the ways which I thought maybe it wouldn't always um, be kind of super relevant would be when when people were traveling more for work, uh, you know, buying picking up food and stuff or train tickets from trains or what have you. Um, in the UK, at least anyway, a lot of these things are still done on card. Um, in machines and then you get kind of physical kind of uh, cards. But you must have seen it, as you mentioned now, or alluded to us, a, a huge shift towards uh, the way of the, the way that, you know, I think Stripe, rep Stripe reported that 35% of money is now moved online kind of as a, which is a huge uptake uh, in the way that this thing is, this thing is working. Yeah. Um, so is it, this is a kind of a, kind of a, a feature from this year, right? Uh, yeah, it was, yeah, I think for Gmail it was launched early early in this year and i think we just lost microsoft a couple of months ago right um, okay. and it, it and kind of how would um would you build different solutions for different email providers then over time yeah so so we looked at and we looked at the data right like what where do what type of emails do they have right yeah. and I, so we started like google was was the biggest one mm -hmm. uh, this, uh, microsoft was the second one and we cover i think 80 percent or something now yeah, so yeah. i don't think we will build it for every single user so then the next will probably be like some type of forwarding or uh, there are other suppliers who might work with that, that can do certain things yeah. but but that's one way but to your point like there are there are players that are doing somewhat of this online or like offline as well so yeah. like we have integrations with storebox in denmark that like if you go to you know one of the bigger stores in denmark we will automatically fetch the receipt for you or they will send it to us and we'll attach it. so it does happen and i think this flux in the uk that, that we have a partnership with um and they are they are growing but they are not that that market share because it's such a fragmented market with, with point of sales uh, but but uh there there, there are various ways and, and to your point of success here this is also like you know in terms of like how do we how do we make this easy i think in this one we were also trying to do like from a, from a total way we're trying to make it really easy for the user but we also wanted to to make the product feel a bit cool 
right? And, and how people maybe talk about this on social media and all yeah. reviews. Yeah. I yeah. think building products is, is not just about like functionality and reducing time. And although that's key, it's also like, how does it feel, right? Like, and it feels a lot cooler when this happens, you get a push notification like, hey, we're gonna take care of this when the email comes in, don't worry about it. And, like, and you're just like, oh, okay, that's kind of cool. Like th that's also the feelings for you. We want to not just build functionality. We want to we want to promote. Uh, sounds easy again, but like feelings. But the, like yeah, this is where where we can, right? Absolutely. We had um we've had a a Swedish uh, company called Hedvig on the show a yeah. few months back, and they showed off their referral mechanism, which I think speaks exactly to the same way that you were talking then about um, customer delight in a way being a super powerful tool for getting people to to love your product. Um, and they were using that in order to get people to invite friends on and and talking about the unit economics of those like it, it far pays off to have this sort of functionality built in and a referral mechanism in their case and you know in yours um, something which is sort of super poppy and delightful coming out like a notification to say this is done you don't have to worry about it celebrate that fact or, or what have you um, so I think that's a really compelling uh, use case and an important one to consider when building um, mm -hmm. But on that note, before we let you go, um, this is all super compelling functionality that you showed us today. What happens next for Plio? Yeah. I think Plio is, is on that journey of, uh, of becoming a full business band solution. Uh, we, we started with covering the card use case. We're now also covering out of like out of pocket expenses, mileage per diem, all those type of functionalities. Yeah. Um, and, but, but I think this space, like the problems connected with spend are not, they're almost agnostic to the means of payment. I think most solutions focus on like bills or out of pocket expense management or card, but, but they are, they're the same issues. Like, yeah, and they're so connected. So, so we are taking that product very much in that sense. And I think next week we are, we're launching our, our, our first version of bills in the UK. Right. Uh, which is super exciting for, for a number of alpha customers on using Zero. Mm -hmm. You'll be able to pay bills uh, from our platform and, and have that fully integrated to the rest of the system. So I think that's that's an obvious way how we're kind of shifting from a, a card, card spend product to like your, your, your one personal assistant for, for business spend in a way. Uh, awesome. Um, thank you very much, Ulof. And that's a super exciting time to head pop there. Thanks very much for chatting. Thank you so much for having me. It was a, it was a blast. Oh,